said, you know, I find Indonesia a very fascinating and important country. And I think, um, I think there's a great deal to learn uh, from its history and from its literatures and from its um, other arts, you know, and, and, and of course also in many other areas, but I'm sticking here to the things that I, I work on. Um, and, and so for me, the opportunity to introduce Indonesia to Israeli students was, was something and still is something very special and very important to me. Inilah Endgame. Halo teman-teman, hari ini kita kedatangan Profesor Ronit Ricci, Chair dari Department Asian Studies di Hebrew University. Hi Ronit. Hi. Thank you so Very much. Nice to be here. Thank you so Thank much you. for 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 making it, uh, you know, to our show. Uh, uh, I know you you're you're a few hours, you know, away from us. Uh, appreciate doing a Zoom call. I wanna I wanna spend you know the next hopefully hour and a little bit more to to talk about you know how you grew up and what you're busy with or what you've been busy with, and and what what you think makes sense for Indonesia. Uh, to be culturally richer, uh, not that it's not rich, it's already rich, but, but I think, you know, the mission is, is really for how Indonesia could, could expose itself, how it could project, you know, its soft power to the world uh, in, in hopefully a wider manner. Please tell us where and how you grew up and what got you interested into Indonesia. So first of all, thank you very much for having me today. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I grew up in Jerusalem. Um, I was born in the United States, but when I was very young, uh, my parents uh, moved to Israel. My mother returned. She, she grew up here and my father immigrated uh, to Israel. Um, so I grew up here and um, after finishing high school, I served in the Israeli army, which is uh, something that everyone here uh, does. And then uh, I went to the university um, and I studied uh, psychology and Indian languages and literatures. Wow. Um, and somehow um, I, I got very, very fascinated with India. I had also traveled there for, for about six months um, before going to university. Um, and so I continued. I also did a master's degree and I was mostly interested in the literary uh, side of things. Um, while I was doing my MA, my, my professor here at the university uh, suggested to me that I consider doing a PhD on Indonesia. Wow. Um, now, for me, that was a complete uh, surprise okay. and also a complete unknown. I had never been to Indonesia. I barely sort of knew where it was on the map. Um, but because uh, Israel and Indonesia do not have diplomatic relations and never have had such relations, uh, it's a country that we here know very little about. Um, and, and so when he suggested it, um, it seemed, uh, you know, I had to think about it for a while but basic, and make a decision, but basically uh, it was for me like opening a door to an unknown world and it felt like a very, it might be a very big, fascinating adventure. And so I, I thought, okay, why not? Um, and that, that's really, I mean, that's, that's kind of my story about how it all began began because um, it was a place that I didn't really know anything about. But the only thing I did know, and that was really the connection, uh, the initial connection was um, because I had been studying about India, that India and Indonesia, at least in ancient times, um, shared a great deal and that there was a lot of, um, there were many elements of Indian civilization that Correct. you know were adopted and adapted in Indonesia. But I had a very sort of fuzzy uh, general sense of that. Um, now, presumably then, your, your professor was already familiar with Indonesia? Or um, he just my, thought my, it was... Yeah, my professor, his name is David Schulman. He's okay. a, a world-renowned uh, uh, specialist on India. Right. Um, he, um, he, knew, he knew something about Indonesia. He had uh, been to Indonesia once, I think. He read widely about it, mm. and he thought it would be very interesting to introduce that field uh, to Israeli academia mm. uh, because there was no one uh, working on Indonesia at all on any aspect of that. Um, and so then I went to the United States to study. I did a PhD. Um, 
during those years, I also uh, went to uh, Indonesia, spent a year in Yogyakarta. Uh, and when I, um, when I finished, when I completed the PhD, I um, then had a postdoctoral fellowship in Singapore. I spent two years in Singapore. Then I um, got a job at the Australian National University uh, in Canberra. And, and finally, after all of those years of being away, about 15 or 16 years uh, in total of being away from Israel, studying, traveling, uh, raising a family, you know, starting a family. And uh, after all of that, um, I was able to uh, return to Israel, which is something that I was hoping to do, but wasn't sure uh, would be possible. Um, and, and really one of the reasons that I was able to return here was that there was a job that opened up. Um, okay. And I, I knew that I would be able to actually um, you know, not, not just um, have this knowledge that I gained along the way, but that I would be able to teach and to share it with others. Talk, talk a little bit about what made you stay as long as one year in Yogyakarta. And, and, and did, it, did it change your predisposition, uh, you know, from earlier uh, times or did it even reinforce certain things that you had thought about Indonesia? Yeah, well, uh, of course, it, it, it changed uh, my perspective. It, it yeah. deepened, you know, my perspective. I, um, I had been studying Bahasa Indonesia and also a little bit of Bahasa Jawa um, oh. in the United States. Um, but of course, it's, it's always better to study a language uh, in situ, you know, to be surrounded by other people who speak it, who speak it naturally, um, not like you speak to students in a classroom, which is, you know, you know, slower and uh, more correct and everything. Um, and um, and that, that year in Jogja was very, very important in all kinds of ways. So, so just living, you know, day to day life uh, in an Indonesian city um, and I, I, I was there with, with my family and my children went to a local TK and, uh, wow. and that was also very important because we got to know, you know, we got to know neighbors, we got to know the parents of other children, we got to see how children, young children were raised, you know, and, and, and of course there are in different places, there are different ideas about what it means to be a parent, what it means to be a child, um, uh, what, what, what kids do, um, what they don't do. Um, so that was also very interesting and very significant. I felt it allowed me, um, you know, not just an intellectual academic perspective, but a uh, much wider um, view. Um, and in terms of what I was doing research-wise, um, I was um, actually doing my dissertation research. Um, I don't know if this is the right time to, to talk about it, but uh, basically I was... Um, I, I decided for my uh, dissertation to study a particular textual tradition um, and it, in its many variations. Um, and the, the, the basic story of this text is, um, it talks about a meeting uh, in seventh century Arabia between the prophet Muhammad and a Jewish leader by the name of Abdullah Salman. ibn Salam. Yeah. And, uh, and, Salam, and uh, Abdullah ibn Salam, uh, comes to the prophet uh, right. with a thousand questions that he had prepared in advance, that he had thought about in advance. And uh, he approaches the prophet and he says that uh, he would like to ask him these a thousand questions. And if the prophet replies correctly, uh, then Ibn Salam, along with all of his people, because he's described as a rabbi or as the leader of the Jewish people at the time, they will all embrace Islam. Um, so this was this is the sort of the basic outline yeah. of the story and the questions I wanted to ask uh, and use this textual tradition as a, as a window uh, were questions about the Islamization of Indonesia of Java in particular but not only Java um, and the ways in which um, we can study religious conversion religious change uh, Islamization through uh, the perspective of literature and through the perspective of text, because there have been many studies about the Islamization of Indonesia and the region, um, some of them based on archaeology, some on history, uh, some on linguistics. I mean, you know, there are many perspectives that you can take, and I wanted to uh, take the literary perspective um, and also to compare it to what was happening uh, 
in this regard in South India. So again, I, at that time, I was still uh, very much connected to my past of uh, working on India. And so I, con I compared the two regions, uh, Indonesia and South India. Now in Jogja, I was ma ma mainly uh, going every day to uh, uh, library, especially in the Puro Paku Alaman uh, in Jogjakarta, which has a very wonderful manuscript library, right. and uh, just struggling, struggling, trying to read the Javanese versions of this story, little by little, you know, managing a little bit more and a little bit more. Um, Amazing. Amazing. Now, uh, Abdullah ibn Salam was, was older than Prophet Muhammad, right? He was, what, 10 to 20 years older? Um, he, he was... Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and draw, draw the picture again in terms of how that conversation between Prophet Muhammad and him would have repercussions on the Islamization of India vis-a-vis -vis that in, you know, Indonesia? Yes. Yeah. So, I, yes. So, so um, I, I, I didn't explain the, you know, what actually happened. That, uh, yeah. the, the outline is that there are these thousand questions. It's, it's it's usually in Malay. I looked also at Malay version, yeah. so it's called Hikayat Seribu Masail, or just Seribu Masail or Seribu Masala. Uh, in Java, it's actually called Sarat Samud, and Samud mm. is the Javanese name uh, given to Abdullah ibn Salam. Uh, so, in the Javanese title, we have less of this um, the framework of the a thousand questions, but. Um, what, what happens is um, the prophet uh, says, you know, of course, please uh, go ahead, ask me these questions. And then the rest of the text is, um, I wouldn't even say it's a debate, a question and answer debate, but it's more of a Samud or Ibn Salam asks ask a question, the prophet replies. He asks the ne next question, he gets a reply. So the, the um, most of the text is made up of these question, answer, question, answer, and there are not a thousand of them, but there are several hundred usually, depending on the version. And then by the end, uh, Abdullah ibn Salam says, I acknowledge your truth, and I uh, I see that you know you, you are the prophet of truth, you are the final prophet, and therefore I accept your religion, and there is sometimes yeah. also a description of it. Um, but, but what allows it to be such a, what I thought was a very good... Um, text for comparison is that the questions and the answers are different from one version to another. Um, and so that allows you to see what was the agenda for different communities mm. uh, throughout history in terms of what was important to them, what were they trying to figure out, what questions were, you know, at the top of the list in terms of understanding Islam. Because I think, you know, we can take it very literally. Um, and we can take it more metaphorically in terms of thinking about the process of Islamization. A another thing I, I want to say, mm. because you, you started by asking me about my own background, uh, and this is related, um, that when I set out to, to study Indonesia, as I, as I said, you know, I knew very little about it. Um, it was a place that I thought was very, very different and distant Right. Uh, from my own. And that's what was, you know, you, we, we're drawn to to learn about something that's very different from us. We're curious. Um, and then after studying for several years in the United States and looking at different literary corpuses and, and learning some history, and I, I came across mention of this 1,000 question, the book of 1,000 questions. Um, and it really fascinated me. And I thought to myself, in the end, here I am studying about a Jew and a Muslim in dialogue. Yeah. Uh, and this is something that is entirely related to my own life, my own personal history, right. the kinds of things I try to advocate for now in Israel. Um, so so that, that in itself was very interesting for me to see that although I thought I was going to a very, very distant and different place, right. I wound up, first of all, finding a topic that very much spoke to me personally, um, but also indicated that, in fact, um, it's not such a different place in yeah. many ways. Yeah. Well, I mean, he, he ended up converting to Islam. Mm -hmm. And, and yes. I think, you know, you know, I've been telling people that Indonesia is a place that's uniquely, you know, one that has gone through, you know, Hinduism, for 600 years, Buddhism for 400 years, and Islam colonialization 
Christianity, independence, democratization for six, seven hundred years, you know, we go through these episodes, right? Where I think, you know, we're innately so tolerant with so many differing forces or differing influences. And it's not unlike what you're going through in your part of the world, right? Where there are so many differing influences or forces. And, 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 and the fact that, you know, the city of Medina, you know, in the old days was a place where I think there was a lot of tolerance amongst different Abrahamic, you know, beliefs. And that is, I think, the kind of picture that we want to basically draw for the future of, you know, many people, you know. Definitely. I mean, I, I, I would like to say that we are also tolerant over here in our part of the world. <laughs> um, but we could use, we could, you know, we could take a few lessons uh, yeah. probably from Indonesia. But I think, I think you're right that there is in Indonesian history, there is this uh, great openness to change and to to adapt adapting and and to accepting you know ideas and and trends from elsewhere and I think you know in in the past especially this was often seen by scholars certainly in the colonial period um, as if Indonesia was always somehow at the receiving end of something you know of Islam right. of Indian civilization. But I think that, and, and so that the Indonesian were just, were just um, accepting something from elsewhere as if they didn't have their own, you know, enough of their own culture or, um, but, but I, 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 I think of it very differently. I think this kind of openness uh, is, is a very positive thing. And it also allows for incredible creativity because yeah. again, I'm talking only about, you know, the, 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 the my small world of knowledge. I'm not, I can't say, you know, much about other things, but I don't want to generalize. But when you look at the textual traditions of Indonesia, when you look at the uh, what people did with texts that came from, probably came initially from Arabia or from other places in the Muslim world or from India, um, the, the, the level of, of, of creativity and, and originality that you see in the way these texts were rewritten and reshaped is, is incredible. Wow. Um, so if you look at it superficially, you could say, oh, they just took this from over here and this from over there. But in fact, it's something very, very different. Fascinating. Well, I mean, it's, it's probably a good time to pivot to, you know, the book that you wrote, you know, about, you know, Sarandip, Lanka and Ceylon, which basically went through that experience as early as the 17th century, where Indonesia was actually projecting its influences, you know, onto some other island beyond. Uh, yes, well, I, um, I spent uh, several years um, studying the history and the literature of a community that today is known as the, as the Sri Lanka Malays. Yeah. Um, and the, these people, um, this is a community that still is still uh, part of uh, Sri Lankan society today. Uh, but it started out uh, in the late 17th century with um, people who were uh, exiled or sent in various capacities by the Dutch, who were then already ruling parts of Indonesia, uh, the VOC, the Dutch East India Company, um, sent them uh, to the island of Ceylon, today Sri Lanka, which uh, was also under Dutch control in part. Um, and this, this really is, this story is one part or one chapter uh, in the larger story of forced migration and banishment um, in the colonial period. Um, we know, I mean, this is, this is, I think, more well known for Indonesians who uh, study history. We know that there were uh, people exiled or sent away from various, within Indonesia, within right. what's now Indonesia, uh, like uh, Diko Negoro or, you know, or other, other, or Sheikh Yusuf, Sheikh Yusuf of Makassar, who is also a, uh, an important figure, he was actually sent away to Ceylon. So, so the Dutch used um, exile um, as, a, as a punishment and also uh, to deter people from uh, doing things that uh, were uh, viewed as um, rebellious or anti-Dutch. Uh, but they also sent uh, away people who were criminals, who were convicts, uh, as well as uh, 
uh, servants, slaves, uh, soldiers who served, soldiers from across the archipelago who, uh, who, who served in the Dutch colonial army. Um, so the, all of these types of people are the forefathers, were the forefathers of this community uh, that is known today as Malays. And so I read about, I read about them. I first came across a uh, mention of uh, this community in a footnote in a book that I was reading. Um, and I was very immediately very interested because I, first of all, because I had not heard about this subject yeah. and I thought, how is it that I've been studying Indonesian history and I, I never heard about this. Um, well, I can assure you, a lot of Indonesians are probably a nerd about this, you know. Yeah, yes, yes. So I think, I mean, that's also, in my opinion, an interesting yeah. question. Why was this left out? Yeah. Uh, why was this episode left out of the history books or, you know, maybe the more conventional history books that kids uh, study at school? I mean, the history books can't contain everything. History is much, right. much bigger than the, the, you know, the 200 pages or whatever that you have in the book. But, but still, choices are made. And, and I think it, it is interesting to think in modern Indonesia to think uh, about why the question of exile and banishment uh, was left out of the history books. And we, we might think, especially in terms of the Suharto period, we might think um, of reasons uh, why this, uh, this was not really discussed. Um, but um, the, the other thing that really sort of, I think, drew me to this topic, except for the curiosity, okay, I've never heard about it, so, um, so it's interesting. But, but I think also just the, the, the thought of people uh, in places like Java or Madura or Bali or Ambon or getting on, on a boat, being yeah. you know shipped away uh, in the 17th century or the 18th century. Most of them were sent away during the 18th century, um, including very important people uh, from the central Javanese um, courts of uh, especially Kartasura and Surakarta in, yep. in the early 18th century. What was it like? What, what kind of experiences did people have at that time uh, being sent away, probably never to return? Um, some of them were able to return. Some of them were returned after death and reburied in yeah. places like Java. But basically, it was a one-way ticket. Um, and I thought, so I thought the human element uh, of this story was... Uh, very, very interesting to to try to explore. Um, were, were they able to assimilate with the pre-existing ethnicities? In in Ceylon? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, for sure, some of them did. Um, th there's no doubt. Um, however, uh, one of the things that's really sort of interesting and, and I think also remarkable about these people is that despite, you know, the time that has uh, passed, we're talking about, you know, it's, it's 300 years, right. and even, even longer, they, they have maintained uh, a, a cultural and also religious identity that's, that's very strong. Yeah. Uh, they, are, they are a small uh, community. There are about 50,000 of them. Probably, you know, it's, it's not the numbers are not really clear, but yeah. that, that's the official figure. Um, uh, and, and they still speak a, a form of Malay. It, it's now mostly a, a language spoken at home, um, but, but they still maintain the linguistic connection. Um, and, and also, at least into the 20th century, it's, it's no longer really true now, but into the 20th century, they, they continued to write uh, in the Malay language. And one of the things that struck me was that the materials that I was able to, to find um, during this research uh, were, were so similar, really, to what you find in other parts of the Malay world, the Indonesian Malay world. Um, so the, the same stories, the same writing style, the same genres like shair or hikayat. Or, so um, although... There is no doubt that many of them, you know, assimilated and married, you know, into other uh, groups, and and we don't really have a record of how many of those uh, there were or, or or have you know sort of over time left the community. Um, there, they still um, manage to to remain a distinct community yeah. within uh, within Sri Lanka. Now, when probably most of the um, marriages uh, and assimilation, if that's you know what we call it, uh, happened uh, between them and the Muslim community that already 
existed in yeah. the colonial Ceylon, which was mostly a Tamil, Tamil speaking yeah. um, community. Um, and less so with a, with a Sinhala. And, and it's also, but it's also important to say that in the early stages in the 17th and 18th century, we, we do have records not only of, uh, of Muslim people coming from the archipelago, uh, there's evidence of, of, of Christians and there's evidence of uh, Hindus because we have, uh, there were Balinese who were um, uh, conscripted, I guess you could say, into the uh, colonial army. Um, and people from, from Ambon, from Eastern Indonesia, who are Christians. It's also mentioned, I mean, not just because of their, their place of origin. Um, but when we look at the community today, the two things I would say that, um, that really distinguish them uh, are their adherence to Islam and their, um, uh, their use of the Malay language. How so would... these are the two things that have remained with them. How, how in your view, would they differ from the Malay community in South Africa, who, mm. who, who you could argue would have been banished or exiled to some extent, right? Yes, yeah. um, I, I, I know less about the community yeah. in South Africa, but I can, I can say that um, it's, it's true there is a community that's today known as the Cape Malays, yeah. Uh, in South Africa, especially in the area of uh, Cape Town, but there is also um, the aforementioned uh, Sheikh Yusuf of Makassar, yes. who was a very important Correct. religious leader, uh, but also very important um, sort of anti-Dutch uh, yeah. fighter. He he was sent first to Ceylon, where he spent ten years there, um, and he's also he was one of the people who arrived there uh, very early and. Um, in the uh, 1680s, and after ten years. Um, the Dutch were still worried about him, even though he was a very old man by then, especially by the standards of the late 17th century. Uh, he was very old and he, was, he had already been in exile for, um, for 10 years, for a decade. Still, they felt that he, his connections, his networks were too strong, too threatening. And then he was shipped further afield to the Cape. Um, and so there is still a place today where... Um, uh, where he is buried. I mean, he has several burial sites, but one of them is in South Africa, and that place is called Makassar uh, for his place of origin. So, so there is this community, um, but the, the, the so-called Malays in South Africa, they uh, were a much more mixed, even at the beginning, right. but certainly today, a much more mixed population. Um, and many of them uh, were sent to South Africa as slaves. There were many slaves from across Indonesia and also from Sri Lanka and India sent uh, to South Africa. Um, and that became a much, much more mixed population with the local uh, people than in Sri Lanka. Um, there were also some uh, people from royal families sent uh, yeah. to the Cape, um, but many more were sent to Ceylon. Um, and so uh, that may explain also, uh, at least in part, the, the, the fact that the, this community remained more distinct um, because also because of these status differences. That, of yeah. course, they couldn't maintain uh, the way they were maintained in, in Indonesia. Um, but still, we have uh, evidence of, of um, people marrying within elite families or trying at least to... Um, to maintain uh, some of the status they had. Um, they were also often um, living in separate quarters because the Dutch yeah. uh, were watching over them much more than on other people who were considered less, less important and less influential. You know, in, uh, let's go back to the Sarandip, Lanka and Ceylon book, right? You, you, you talked about many of the literary uh, remnants or even you know still existing today right uh, ongoing you know within very much within the culture the day-to-day -day culture of these you know 50,000 people living there uh, in in your view how would that literary journey differ from what we have gone through in the last two to three hundred years or do you see commonality in 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 the way that they actually were, you know, leaving these literary, you know, experiences, you know, for their children, grandchildren, and beyond. 
Um, I think, you know, I think in what happened um, in Ceylon was that um, probably some of the texts were brought along with the early exiles, yeah. um, especially, again, especially people who were from uh, the upper echelons of society and probably had more access to, to writing and to, um, to manuscripts. Um, because uh, most of most of what we still have um, from, again, we, we have very, very little from the 18th century. We have a mm. few letters, um, a few documents. Uh, there are many Dutch documents, but I mean documents written in the Malay language or in another Indonesian language in Ceylon. That is very, very rare. Uh, in the ninth, from the 19th century, we have more. Um, so people were probably copying and recopying um, books that they had brought with them or maybe putting down in writing stories that they had heard orally uh, in their families. Again, it's, it's, it's hard to reconstruct the very early uh, period of this. Um, and, um, and also, especially in the 19th century when Ceylon was under British rule, because in right. 1796 the British took over Ceylon, um, they, they kept, um, for a while at least, they kept trying especially to recruit uh, soldiers from across the Indonesian archipelago and to bring them to Ceylon uh, in order to sort of fortify their rule. Uh, the Malays, and when I say Malays, I, I should have explained this, but Malay is a kind of an umbrella term that yeah. the community itself is using. But in fact, um, the, the, it's, it, it's made up of people who are descendants of uh, people from all over the archipelago and also the Malay, Malay Peninsula. So that's another interesting question, how they came to be known as Malays. Yeah. Um, but um, so, 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 the, so they were considered a martial race, just like other groups uh, in British India. Uh, the British, you know, looked at the population and they, they picked out certain groups uh, like the Gurkhas, for example, yep. in Nepal, or the Punjabis. So the Malays were considered a, a martial race. They were considered very uh, courageous, very brave, uh, mm. willing to, you know, to fight till the end. The 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 concept of namuk, you know, to what we say in English, to run amok, yeah. but it's actually derives from Malay. Um, that was a, 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 that appears again and again and again in the records that these people were willing, you know, to run amok. They were willing if there was an enemy, they would do anything. Um, mm. So therefore, the British sort of inherited these people in their army from the Dutch, and they kept trying to recruit additional people from the Indonesian archipelago in the 19th century. And I'm saying this because there was a flow of sort of new people also coming in and they would also bring, yeah. you know, manuscripts and stories and texts. Um, and these were sort of retold uh, at least into the early 20th century. Um, and, and, and then there's also some original production of texts. So um, there, for example, there are some shair, some um, mm. texts written in, in poetic meters that yeah. were written in Ceylon. Uh, by people who were descendants and and still were able to master the rules of these uh, genres and write in Malay. Um, one very famous case is uh, a book titled Shair Faid al uh, which was written at the turn of the 20th century, um, looking back sort of and recapping the history of the community um, in Ceylon. And connected with what you asked, you know, about passing to the next, passing this on to the next generation, the author whose name was uh, Baba Unus Saldin, he says explicitly in his introduction that he is writing this book because um, he's worried that the younger generation, you know, that's always the case, we always worry about the younger generation doesn't know enough or doesn't remember enough. So he's writing this in order to make sure that they will know the history of their community in Ceylon. So it, it doesn't go back to what happened in Indonesia or where, you know, what happened to their forefathers uh, that caused them to be sent to Ceylon. It just begins with the island itself. It begins with the story of Adam, Nabi Adam, yeah. um, who, who, who is the forefather, not just of all Muslims, but of all of humanity, who was banished from paradise and happened to uh, find himself on um, Mount Sarandib. This is a very old Arab tradition. So he opens with that, and that sort of locates um, the Malays um, not in not only in a godforsaken island to where they were exiled, but also at the place where 
humanity first touched this earth. And then he goes on to, uh, to talk about their own history on the island. That's amazing. So that, that's an example of how, you know, how texts both came with the early exiles, came from Indonesia, came from the Malay Peninsula, but then uh, people continued to use the language and also the literary genres to, to produce their own uh, literature and history. You know, they should, they should come out here and tell this story <laughs> to the Indonesians. You know, I think, I, 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 think, I, think they, I think they would love to. I mean, I think, um, you know, that, that touches on other questions, you know, more political questions of, of, of the present, right? We right. have the history, a long history, and then we have the present. What's happening in the present? And, uh, and in fact, you know, Malaysia has been much... I don't know if to say much better, but, you know, and you know, I mean, I don't, but Malaysia has been much more sort of, yeah. has acknowledged them a lot more. Yeah, they've been uh, more proactive. They've yeah. been more proactive and they've yeah. been more, uh, in, in, not just in acknowledgement, but also in funding. So, yeah. um, so there are like annual uh, Hari Bahasa Melayu, I think right. it's called, where right. they where 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 they encourage yeah. the children to write essays in Malay or poems, and there's a competition, yeah. and and various things like that, which are really yeah. uh, supported uh, also financially by the Embassy of Malaysia. So if you <laughs> if you have any contacts with the Indonesian side of things, you well, can... I'm I'm hopeful that some people will watch this content and you know recognize uh, you know something that needs to be done. I, I met a few, um, I met many, many Malay families because uh, my research was basically based on going from family to family and searching for documents because right. there is no archive or library where you can access uh, this literature or these documents. But um, along the way, I did meet a few uh, people who had traveled to Indonesia and looked for, you know, looked for, search for their roots. Uh, it's very difficult, almost impossible or to find, you know, actual relatives because most people in Sri Lanka have absolutely no documentation of yeah. their genealogy. Um, again, except for people who claim to be from royal families, um, they don't have documents, but it might be that these kinds of families kept the memory alive, uh, again, because of their status. And um, but 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 people do not have any documentation, so it's very hard for them to come to Indonesia and actually find, you know, blood relatives. But people have traveled, have come to Indonesia just just to see the place, you know, and to visit places that they may have heard about from their in family stories, um, and found it very moving. And found it what people always said was that it, it felt in some ways very very familiar even though they had never been to Indonesia yeah. and even though a lot has changed, you know, over time and everywhere, but, but that there was something for them, especially the older people, there was something for them that felt very, very familiar. You know, I've been to Sri Lanka a few times, but I've not had the pleasure of meeting up with somebody who's a descendant of the Malay people, right? From Indonesia or the archipelago, but I've been to other places. Uh, called Madagascar and South Africa, mm -hmm. where I have met many people who just look like me. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. kind of weird, yes. you know, and they're, they're actually the ones who come up and tell me, hey, dude, you know, my ancestors came from your place two to three hundred years ago, you know, from this island, from that island and all that. It's, it's, it feels weird, but it feels really good. <laughs> just yes, to be able to exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's a it's a special feeling. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, and the looks. You're right. I mean, to me also. I mean, not all the people, because of course they, they're very mixed by now. But here and there, I, I I met someone who, yeah, who looked completely Indonesian <laughs> or Javanese or, um, and and maybe maybe I can mention uh, one more thing really about the Javanese because that's also my sort of. You know, we're talking about Indonesia, but uh, of course, people who study Indonesia will usually study, you know, or at least emphasize one part of Indonesia more than another because it's a huge country and so diverse yeah. in so many ways, and it's hard to, you know, um, encompass everything. So, so for me, it's Java, and um, and one of the questions that really interested me was where, why, why is everything that we find in Malay? 
um, again, we, we, we can't find a lot. Mo most of the documents and manuscripts have been lost, uh, you know, with the climate and people not really, right. you know, losing them or not passing them on. And so we, we have a small archive uh, of texts, but um, why is it all in Malay? If people came from all over the archipelago, what happened to the other languages? Um, and certainly if we're thinking about people like from the, you know, Kraton in, in Solo or, I mean, they must have, you know, they must have known Javanese and people came from Bali, Nubasa, Bali, sure. et cetera. So, um, so, so here and there, very, very rarely, I, I, I did find a few, um, a few things uh, written, very small, very small sections of text written in Bahasa Jawa. And um, I think including a poem um, that may be familiar to some of the, of the you know, some, some people in the audience, it's called Kidung Rumekso in Wangi. Um, the the song guarding in the night wow. and it's it's still you got me very it's <laughs> <You got me laughs> it's it, it's a it's a poem that's attributed to Sunan Kali Jogo you know one of the yes. uh, leaders of the Wali Songo uh, yeah. the yeah. nine Walis who who are said to have brought Islam to Java um, so it's a poem uh, that that offers protection um, uh, and that that it, like I said, the song "Guarding in the Night." So it's 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 a poem that's supposed to offer protection from many things, from fire, from flood, from jinn, you know, from the danger of various beings that um, that lurk out there in the darkness. Um, so I thought it was very interesting to find that particular poem uh, among the writings of people who were themselves in exile in in a kind of a dark place or dark period. Um, of their of their own you know of their own life, um, but it also indicates to us that um, there is room for much much more research. My my research was, you know, in in, in I mean I, I worked very hard at, at it and it took me a long time, but it's still in some ways very preliminary. Um, and and there is I I mean for for in, especially for Indonesian students you know who who may be looking for something to to think about or to research further. So, I mean, the fact that we can find here and there a Javanese poem and maybe, you know, um, writings in other languages, um, that, that, that indicates that there's still a lot to uncover about this history, I think. Amazing. I'm just curious. You, you spent your, 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 your whole day at your university talking about, you know, Indonesia and, of course, India to some extent. But... How, how would the students react to what you have to say about all this? <laughs> uh, I, I hope I'm not boring them does to it, death. Does it, does it evoke even more curiosity? It, this, this will take us, I think, to, to the next point that I want to bring up in terms of how we can actually become closer, right? And, and I think there's, there's a lot to be done uh, in, in order to try to get you know, the two places to understand better and, and, and more closely. But, yes, but how, thank, thank just, you just very explain much. the reaction of your yeah. students. Yeah, no, <laughs> these, thank, these thank you very much. These are students who are forced for... to take an, uh, you know, an elective with you, or these are actually students who sign up, who want to, you know, actually try to get a better understanding of what's happening in this part of the world. Yeah, th thank you for asking me that because it's really something I, I do want to to mention. Yeah. So, um, I, I I mentioned that when I when I was able to come back to Israel after a long time of of, of living away, um, one one of my sort of main incentives was that I knew that I would be able to uh, start developing this field of Indonesian studies in Israel, which it 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 doesn't. Mm. It, it didn't really exist, and, and still we are, I'm at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, we are the only university in the country that offers such a program and that offers Bahasa Indonesia for the students and, and various courses um, on Indonesia. Um, and to me, that was a challenge that I really wanted to embrace. Um, and that is because uh, you can see from everything I've said, you know, I find Indonesia a very fascinating and important country and I think um, I think there's a great deal to learn uh, from its history and from its literatures and from its um, other arts you know and, and and of course also in many other areas but I'm sticking here to the things that I, I work on um, and 
And so for me, the opportunity to introduce Indonesia to Israeli students was, was something and still is something very special and very important to me. Um, in part, again, because it's a country that uh, we don't have diplomatic relations with. And so people here know relatively little about it. Here and there, I mean, there are people who've gone to Indonesia and, and traveled and, and, uh, or read about it. But in general, compared to other countries of the world and, and compared to other countries in Asia, which people here know a great deal about or are very interested in, like China or Japan or India, um, Indonesia is sort of sidelined. Um, and so I wanted to change that as, as, as much as I could. Um, and the, another, another sort of aspect of this, another dimension, is the fact that um, because of the history of, of Islamization, because Indonesia has a very large Muslim population, the country with the largest Muslim population in the world, really, um, I think, you know, the historical and, and, and cultural and religious and linguistic connection between Indonesia and the Middle East go back hundreds of years and they continue today. And Israel is located in this part of the world. Um, and so I think that's another um, element that's very important for Israeli students to understand and to think about. Um, and, um, you know, for all kinds of reasons, uh, the students here and, and people in general, you know, are very used to thinking about um, Islam and Arabness as one and the same. Um, and again, this is sort of to be expected, um, but I think it's very, very important to to expand their minds also on that and to for them to understand that Islam is a global civilization right. um, and that the majority uh, of Muslims, in fact, today, 80% of them live outside of the Middle East. It, it doesn't mean that the Middle East is not crucially important, but it means that there's a lot out there that they should know about. So, um, but to, back to your question, um, uh, this is not like, no no one is forced uh, to take um, Bahasa Indonesia or the courses on in Indonesia. I was, I was so only kidding. They're mo they're mo yeah, no, I know, I know. But it also means that, you know, it means that, that, that the students have to choose to do this. Okay. So um, in some ways it would be good if, if um, you know, if it was a mandatory course, so so then some people who think it's not interesting would actually discover that it is. But um, but every year we have more uh, more students. Um, we have now a beginner beginners course in Bahasa Indonesia and an advanced course, and then we have tech courses where a little bit even more advanced, where where um, we read simple texts. I mean, we we don't have we can't offer them yet at this point. Uh, enough hours of language instruction so that right. they'll actually be very fluent because we and this is mostly a, a question of funding um, but 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 uh, this is our the first year that we have an Indonesian uh, her name is Betty Susiarjo who is teaching the language so she, she's the first Indonesian citizen who's teaching Indonesian wow. uh, in Israel and that's okay. wonderful yeah. um, we have, I have a course on, like an introductory course on uh, Indonesian history and culture. We have a gamelan uh, at the university. And wow. so we have a, a, another faculty member teach, teaching the music. We have a, a gamelan workshop uh, that students can sign up to. Um, and also because that's a, still a very small program, we have, uh, we try to bring in uh, guests uh, guest lecturers and people who will teach, you know, for two or three months, will teach like a mini course. Um, and um, and now with Zoom, <laughs> one of we in in uh, general, it's it's a disadvantage, I think, not to be able you know to really be on campus and interact. But uh, Zoom has allowed yeah. us to also have uh, guest lectures from Indonesia. Um, and so it's, and and I I find that the students um, on the whole are very curious and very interested. Um, the ones who start learning the language realize very quickly, just as I did when I started learning it, um, that it, if they know Arabic, um, and even if they know Hebrew without knowing Arabic, they That's, will be familiar with many words yeah. in the Indonesian language. And, and how you um, roll the R's too, right? <laughs> how we roll the R's um, is similar. But I'll just give you an example that a, a, a day, day, daily life example, and that is that the days of the week, you know, in Bahasa Indonesia and in Hebrew are basically the same, except for Mingu, which is which comes from uh, Portuguese. But Senin, Selasa, Rabu, Kamis, Jum'at is a little bit different, and Sabtu. All of those are just 
the same. So, so the students, you know, so that, just like you said about South Africa, you go and someone says, hey, you yeah. look like me. Yeah, it's catchy. I, and, and they start yeah. talking to you. It makes, uh, uh, it makes uh, very early on, they, it makes a connection for them. You know, oh, I'm studying a very distant place, but look at the languages. There is a, a real connection. There is a real similarity. There is a real link via the Arabic language between Indonesian and Hebrew or Indonesian and Arabic. Um, and so... Um, I think relatively early on, they understand that there are many connections and comparisons to be explored. Plus, of course, there is the interest of studying about a place that is in many ways very different. Uh, we try to have, we've had several conferences here. We've had workshops. Um, and two years ago, we even, this I must mention, because we had a Wayang performance. Wow. Uh, and um, and it was it, it and it was really a big success. We had over two hundred people in the audience, which for Indonesia probably sounds very tiny. Was but, it Wayang Kulit uh, or us, Wayang Wayang Kulit? Okay. Wayang Kulit. Um, we had a research group that was here for ten months at the Israel Institute for Advanced Study of people, um, scholars working on Javanese literature. Um, and one of them, Professor Ben Arps from Leiden University, is also a Dalang. So we collected puppets from here and from there. And we, we had a screen built, especially for the performance. And the gamelan played uh, in the background, you know, accompanied uh, the performance. And, he, and um, he did it in English with a little bit of, you know, some, a little bit of Indonesian or Javanese. And he even, you know, inserted a little bit of Hebrew for the you know for the audience to laugh and to to have fun and, and and it was very very successful so these are the kinds of things i think that are very important you know it's not only about talking and giving lectures and yeah. writing articles it's about yeah allowing people to experience something mm. uh of the arts of the music um that um you know that these are all very important i think gateways to to at least imagining Indonesia and hopefully uh, also visiting it in the future for these students and, and others. What are, what are your general expectations with respect to each one of your students that would have gone through your class that, that you think he or she would have gotten a much better understanding of the differences of the two cultures? or regions or countries or it's even more than that in that you know you, you would expect each one of these students to to actually be able to do something good about bridging the gap if there is any well i think i think just knowing something about indonesia you know knowing where it's located in the world knowing something about its history uh, knowing something about its diversity yeah. um because, you know, you know how it is. I mean, it's not nothing special to Indonesia or to Israel, but people uh, often tend to generalize um, yeah. out of or ignorance stereotype. or out of yeah, or, and stereotype. Yes, right. exactly. And um, I think our job, you know, in at the university more generally, not just about this, is is, is to make to try and make people think, to try and make yeah. them be critical, to try and make them ask difficult questions, and and to try and make them see that. There's nothing, nothing simple, nothing yeah. black and white at all. Um, and it, it's when you're talking about your own society, it's always easier for you to see the yeah. complexity and the ambiguity because you know the place. When you right. think about, when you talk about another country, about the other side of the world, it's a lot easier to just stereotype. And yeah. um, and so I, I try to work against that. But I think one of the ways which I think is good to, uh, in terms of trying to learn about a different society is also to see the commonalities and the similarities yeah. again not in a superficial way but to see okay there are some things that are similar or may seem similar on the surface but let's see if they really are similar so um in terms ju just to mention very briefly in terms of israel and indonesia that seem like completely different countries and you know, and, and, and of course, in terms of size and complexity, they, they, they are very, very different. But I think there are also some um, underlying similarities. For example, I always think that someone should study the, someone should compare Bahasa Indonesia and Hebrew, modern Hebrew. Uh, these are two countries that have had enormous success 
with their national language. Yeah. Um, where in the early 20th century, um, in, you know, in Indonesia, oh, yeah. there was a, a very low percentage of people who could speak. I mean, it wasn't even right. called Bahasa Indonesia, yeah, it was, called, you know, it was a form of Malay. Correct. Then they made the decision, you know, at the, 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 this very famous conference, you know, to uh, Satu Bahasa, you know, Bahasa Indonesia. And all of the efforts that were made afterwards, you know, uh, institutional efforts, personal efforts, um, in order to make this into a national language. Yeah, well, and several Sukarno generations- was the guy that basically used that to unify and unite the country. Yes, exactly. Yeah. As a form of unification yeah. and as part of the, you know, making people feel Indonesian. Um, and several generations later, I mean, I don't have to tell you, you know, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, an, it's become a natural language yeah. uh, for ge newer generations of people born in, in, in the country. And with Hebrew, you know, there was a huge struggle about modern Hebrew because for different reasons, but people, many people felt that this was the language of prayer. This was an ancient language that should not be, you know, contaminated with yeah. everyday usage. Um, but eventually the people who fought for, you know, for making it into the national language, they won. And we see a somewhat similar process and we see a huge success in terms, of course, it, of course, there are also prices that you pay for for right. having, a, 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 you know, uh, elevating one language above all others. But I mean, in terms of thinking of, you know, the production, the literary, political, everyday production of um, uh, in the language and the use of the language, I think there are many similarities. They also both have this a father figure. You know, you have Takdir Ali Shabana and we have someone with by the name of Eliezer Ben Yehuda and how you know, a single person, not that they did, they really did it single handedly, but the roles that they play. So, I mean, that's, that's one thing that I, 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 yeah. I could point out. And also more, more in terms of the present, I think um, it's very interesting to compare, you know, the roles of religion and state in Israel and Indonesia. Yeah. Israel does not have a separation between religion and state. Uh, and Indonesia does, at least officially, but we know that, you know, it's, it's a very complicated subject, also in Indonesia. Uh, what is the relationship between the religion of the majority and the state? Um, and how does that relationship uh, affect things like education, like politics, like gender roles? Um, and so Judaism and Islam are two religions that are very, very similar in many ways. I mean, most people don't think <laughs> of it that way, but they actually are very yeah. similar, and they're similar in the way that they guide the believer through life they have a you know very complicated structure of rules and regulations um yeah. it's it's a religion of practice and uh and to look at these two countries um the one where judaism is is so you know central and one where islam is so central and to see how they uh for example how they um confront the question of minority yeah. um it's, so, so these are things that I, I try to point out to the students in order for them to actually be able to connect. Yeah. You know, I've been spending more and more time in, in the educational space, uh, pretty much on a mission to further democratize ideas, right? While I'm seeing more and more of the polarization of ideas, right? And, and I think it's good that, that we have to, you know, that we have this ability to be independent in thinking about what's good in the long run for ourselves and ourselves and the people around ourselves, right? And, and I think it's just a concern that ideas have gotten more and more polarized as of late. And I've been advocating that this is partly attributable to the role of technology, right? And to some extent, the role of politics. And, and we, we, we can go into, you know, what's, what's been happening in your part of the world recently, but, but I, I'm, I'm of the view that, you know, to a large degree, this is politics more than anything, right? And, and how conversations have gotten so polarized in going way out to the left and going way out to the right at the expense of the diminution of the center or centrality. And, and unfortunately or fortunately, there's still a lot of people that belong to the center that I think would bridge the gap, you know, amongst ourselves or between us and yourself and 
many others. What's, what's your view on this? And b before we start talking about your other book, because I want to get to that, but, but I think this is a good segue, you know, to this point of the need to help, you know, further democratize ideas as opposed to polarize ideas. Yes, well, I, I, I'm all for it. Um, and I, I agree with you. I mean, I think, um, I think technology, you know, has played a major role in the way that we, you know, it's, it's in some ways sort of destroyed or destroyed our attention spans. It's harder and harder for us to actually go deep into something like to read a book from cover to cover rather than a text or an email or a Facebook post. I mean, I, I keep hearing that, you know, in order to get the attention of students, we need to, you know, write things Compress. that are shorter and shorter. <laughs> but I'm, I'm not I'm not saying this like as to 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 blame the students. I, I, I also feel it on myself and on right. my colleagues. I think it's more difficult for us to focus. And so and, and in fact, in order to understand another culture or in order to study history or literature or any of the things that we've been talking about or to understand yourself, uh, you can't only use sound bites. You really need to, you know, to read a lot and to think and to get into the nuances of historical, you know, um, circumstances or circumstances of, for, for example, the production of a particular text, you know, its history, how it developed the way it did, why. I mean, so these are things that require time and require concentration. And, and it is becoming, I think, more challenging. Um, uh, yeah. And 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 then also there there is uh, there there is the media you know that what 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 gets reported what doesn't get reported so uh, what 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 is emphasized uh, and that also shapes a lot of what we see and the way we see the world so um, you know not not to not to get you know too deep into uh, recent events but still one thing you know to say about what's happening here is that. Um, you know, with all the really terrible violence uh, over the last few weeks, um, there are many, many uh, initiatives uh, here in Israel and Palestine uh, that try to bridge, uh, bridge the gap. Uh, not, not just now. I mean, I mean, right. all the time. I mean, in recent years, there are many initiatives in, in the fields of education, uh, of, of sustainability, of interfaith initiatives. All kinds of things, academics, academia, things that are happening between um, Israelis and Palestinians, between Jews and Arabs, between neighbors who live in a you know mixed city and 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 are horrified by the you know the eruption of, of violence. Um, th these things barely get any coverage. They're very very significant. They're actually extremely significant in the personal sense, but also for the communities right. and for the country. Um, you rarely hear about them, even here, not to mention, you know, outside. Um, so all of these things, you know, are, um, are, are I think, very significant in how we, um, you know, how, how polarized or not polarized we, we, we are. Yeah. Well, let's, let's pray that, you know, we, we get to be more and more open-minded <laughs> so that we yes. can understand Amen. each other a little bit better. Yeah. Hey, I, I want to I want to switch to your other book. You know, the contentious beginnings, a place for minorities. Contentious belonging. Belonging, sorry, a uh, place for minorities. Uh, talk talk about that. I think it's it's important for us to to hear your views about. You know. Um, yeah. Well, that that's that's um, that's a book that um, I edited. I didn't I didn't actually write yep. the book. I, I was I co-edited. Right. with uh, Professor Greg Feely from the Australian National University. Yep. Um, and uh, the, the, the ANU, the Australian National University, for many years now has had something called the Indonesia Update. Uh, once a year, uh, there's uh, a two-day conference. Uh, you can tell from the name. It's an update about something, uh, some aspect of Indonesian uh, society. It begins, it always begins with a political update and an economic update where people who are very knowledgeable, either from Indonesia or from Australia, usually um, speak uh, about those issues. And then there is a theme um, to, to, the, to the conference. And so we, we did this together a few years ago and we, um, we thought it would be interesting to, um, 
to think more about the question of minorities uh, in Indonesia, um, different kinds of minorities, uh, be it religious minorities, uh, um, minorities in terms of um, LGBT, in terms of um, uh, people with disabilities, uh, ethnic minorities. Uh, and so we invited um, a group of scholars, you know, who, who work on these issues anyway, uh, to present their work. And that was um, later collected into this volume. Um, and, and I think, um, you know, I, I, I hope this is, um, I, I hope this for all of the books, but, but this is one that I really hope um, people in Indonesia will have access to. Um, we, 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 we had some conversations about uh, having it translated into Indonesian, uh, but that didn't materialize. I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure why. I don't know if, um, if the topic was seen as maybe a little bit uh, sensitive um, or whether there were other considerations, but, um, but, but the bottom line is we, we still haven't been able to to get it translated. And so it's, it's not very widely, uh, widely read. What's, what's your view about how Indonesia has and is and will likely treat minorities? Look, it, it's, not, it's not really, you know, it's not something that I personally do research on. So yeah. um, I, I, I think, you know, again, I think that um, Indonesia is a very, very complex place um, and made up of so many different groups, you know, religious yeah. groups, ethnic groups, linguistic groups. It's very, very, it's a very fraught topic. It's very yeah. complicated. I mean, we all have our views, you know, about how, yes, of course, minorities should be treated fairly and they should have the same opportunities and this should be part of the, you know, um, represented in the legal system. At the same time, we know there are many, many challenges in reality. Yeah. Um, and so um, I think, and, and if you look at the book, you, you, you see that it's a very mixed picture. Yeah. There are some uh, cases that are, you know, represent real success stories. And in other ways, there are many challenges that still, you know, have to be overcome. And, and, um, and that's, that's why I said earlier that this is also something that really speaks to me because I look at, you know, my own surroundings. And I think, um, I think here, too, we have a long way to go um, until the minority, especially, of course, uh, the Arab Palestinian minority within Israel, which, which makes up 20 percent of the population. Yeah. And it's not a not small. small minority mm. feels, you know, feels equal, feels that it has the same rights and the same opportunities as the Jewish majority. Um, so um, I'm, I'm sort of very aware of the, you know, of the uh, challenges and also of the, of the gap, you know, that remains uh, in, in most countries, I would say, uh, between yeah. what we would like to see and what, what we actually have. And we have to keep working on it, exactly as you said, uh, <laughs> keep striving and, and working hard. Uh, it's one of the most important things, I think, that, you know, to reach a point where all citizens of a country right. uh, feel like they have um, equal sure. opportunity. Sure. I've, I've, I've been quite vocal about this, uh, you know, the fact mm -hmm. that inequality in many parts of the world has gone up. And, and I think it's important to usher, you know, the equalization of opportunities as opposed to outcomes more than ever. Uh, and, and I think it applies to yourself, ourselves here, and many other places uh, around the world. Let's, let's talk about the future, Ronit. I, I want to I <laughs> get you to draw the picture for where you think Indonesia is likely to go in the next five to ten years and all the way to 2045. Tell us. <laughs> and and well, uh, you can I... put that in the context of how you know, your country and my part of the world could connect a little bit better. Because, you know, we all belong to, you know, the Abrahamic beliefs, right? We've all descended from the same person. And, and, and I think it's, it's, uh, it's upon us to be understanding of the differences and to be understanding of the means and ways to address the differences so that we can coexist, you know, in, in a really cool way. 
Yes. Um, well, first of all, you know, for the next few years, I, 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 I very much hope for Indonesia that um, the pandemic can be overcome. I mean, this is this seems to be the number one thing right now um, uh, for people to remain healthy and safe, you know, and not 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 to not to face illness and and the hardship that comes with that to individuals and to families and and to the country as a whole. Uh, I'm very, very much looking forward to the skies reopening above Indonesia because I, I, I miss it very much. And for me to be away for a long period is, is, is difficult. And I, I'm certainly not the only one. You know, I know there are many, many people uh, looking forward to coming back and visiting and working and studying. And, um, and this is something that I also hope for my students that, that they are able to do. Um, and um, and and again yeah, for the future, I hope it um, you know continues to be the amazing place that it is. That it can cultivate the tolerance uh, towards minorities, and that it remains you know peaceful um, and successful. And from again from my sort of my corner of the world, I I, I do hope that the day comes when uh, Indonesia and Israel can have open relations, can have diplomatic relations. I understand the complexity. I understand the, you know, the the sort of the obstacles to that at the moment. Um, I hope very much that Israel, from its side, um, you know, can can do what needs to be done to to reach political solutions to the problems that we have here, uh, to the very complex. Uh, uh, situation that really, I mean, we've seen again and again uh, that violence and war is not a solution. It doesn't lead us anywhere. It all, always brings us back totally. uh, to the yeah. same place. Uh, or And then we're usually worse off than we were. Uh, it's not even the same place. It, it's a worse place than, you know, we were before and before that and before that. So so uh, I think it's very clear that's not a solution to anything. And, and I hope very much that we can find ways uh, to... Uh, reach political solutions with our neighbors, and that that will uh, hopefully also, I think that will also uh, open the way to relations with Indonesia. Uh, and I think the two countries have a lot to gain from such a relationship. Oh, yeah. uh, we have a lot to learn from each other um, and a lot to share. Uh, but until that happens, um, I, I hope that we can continue building bridges, uh, academic bridges, bridges of research, of studying, and, and, and bridges of, of friendship, um, even, you know, without waiting for the politicians. I mean, this kind of conversation that we're having, or this kind of an interview, and, uh, and, and, and various other initiatives, um, um, I've invited, you know, Indonesian scholars uh, to come to conferences that I organized. That, um, I mean, these, these are the kinds of things that we can do um, Right. Uh, on really more or less on our own without waiting sort of for the major political changes to happen. And, and I think it does matter. And it, it, it's it's our way of uh, of moving forward. It's it's one of the many little steps that we can take. Right. And and if if there is one big point that, you know, we've been making about ourselves is really to move up the ladder in terms of our educational attainment. Right, and you have so much to offer, right? Uh, and and not to mention the technological, you know, advancements that we could learn from. Uh, and yes, we are, you know, the fourth largest country in the world, the third largest democracy in the world, the largest Muslim country in the world. But I think we recognize where we may need some further, you know, enhancements. And and I I, I agree with you. You know, we we do see each other as being able to fulfill each other, you know, in so many dimensions. Uh, I I understand your kids are fans of our instant noodles. <laughs> yeah. Do you do you, do you cook uh, Indonesian food? Or ah, uh, here and there, but. Uh... I, I, I'd always rather go to a, you know, to an Indonesian restaurant than uh, cook myself <laughs> because I'm not, I'm not very good at it. Um, there, there, we don't have an Indonesian uh, restaurant 
per se sort of uh, here, but we, we because there are many, many uh, pilgrims, Indonesian pilgrims who come here uh, every year, you know, as tourists on these package tours, um, about 40,000 per year, uh, pre-COVID. That's a lot. That's um, a lot of instant noodles. It's a lot. It, it, <laughs> no, so there, there, are, there are a few places that, that cater... Um, the cater to the Indonesian tourists or pilgrims, okay. uh, where you can here and there you can get something good. Um, but the noodles, the 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 Indomie uh, or something. I didn't want to mention to the that, brand, uh, but that's okay. Oh, okay, okay, <laughs> that's all right. Okay, sorry, um, advertising them in Israel. Um, the instant noodles, uh, you know, you, you can find them here. Um, sure, so, they're everywhere. Yeah, so, you know, some, some countries yeah. in Africa, I think they, they consume more of that than, you know, their original staple, you know. But, but, but uh, just a few years ago, um, I, I came across a, a, a very nice man who, who actually makes tempeh at home. Before yeah, that, I, I had never... That. Talk, talk uh, about that. I ne I, no, I mean, it's just, it's, a, it's an anecdote, but it's just nice because... Um, it, it, this is someone who uh, who learned how to make tempest somewhere I, I don't remember where you know overseas and came back to Israel and uh, he has a, a small business so um, it's possible to order tempest from him and get it to your doorstep that's that's you know the instant noodles in the tempest that's uh, that's more or less what we have yeah yeah let, let's let's uh, you you raise the topic of uh, the pandemic right and and I think you know it's it's safe to highlight that you know your country has been really good at vaccinating itself right and you're you're well above 100 percent vaccination rate right no no not not there yet above maybe herd immunity at least I, yes yeah. yeah i think 50 something percent maybe 60 percent something okay like that, that's I close think. to herd immunity we're, we're well below that, yes. but but I, yeah. I, I do believe that the more quickly we can vaccinate ourselves, the more quickly we can recover to normalization where we can start thinking of things in a normal way <laughs> as opposed to abnormal way, right? So this, this all, I think, you know, boils down to how quickly we can economically recover. And, and that's key, I think. For, for all of us. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, Israel, you know, was lucky uh, in many ways in the sense that, well, I mean, it was, a, it was a, I guess, a, a very a good decision, you know, to buy the vaccines from Pfizer early on, but also they had an interest, uh, I think, in selling to us because right. Israel is a very small country and it's, it's, it's really like a laboratory for the... Yeah you know, pharmaceutical companies in this respect, because it's a very small country, very small population. Uh, it has one major international airport and all of the other borders around us are, you know, either closed permanently, like with Lebanon or Syria, or closed temporarily with Jordan and Egypt. So it's a closed space, basically. You, you, you have very little mobility of people in and out, so you can actually track what's happening uh, with the virus. Um, Plus, we have a very good system of clinics. So there's a very good infrastructure from the days when Israel was still a socialist country. So that's one of the things that remain. We, we have universal health uh, care and everyone has health insurance. And so through these clinics and, and because of the fact that everyone is you know, connected to one of them and has insurance and doesn't have to worry in that respect, right. uh, people could could be vaccinated relatively very quickly and, and in a very orderly manner. Um, and so that's how we reach the point where we are. I mean, we also have people here who do not want to get the vaccine and there are various conspiracy theories about it. Um, but, but, but the majority of the population um, you know, was, was, I think, uh, very eager to get the vaccine. And right. so uh, we're now, things are, are opening up in a very, very significant way yeah. um, in the, over the last few weeks. So I, I very much hope, you know, the same for Indonesia. Yeah, yeah. Any, any final messages, Ronit, for us here? Final words. Um, <laughs> Um, Look, I mean, I, I, I what, what I get from this is that, you know, you, you, you've played a very big part in understanding, uh, you know, and peeling the onion so much on, on our culture and our linkage with other countries from a cultural standpoint. And I'm a big believer of the fact that culture 
has been a big part of Indonesia and it's going to be a big part of Indonesia, particularly in its, you know, desires to project, you know, itself to the rest of the world in a good way as opposed to bad way. Yes, I, I mean, I, I agree um, that Indonesia has, you know, a great deal to offer, again, in many fields, but if I'm focusing on, on my field of right. research and teaching, uh, which is which is literature and culture and languages, it, it has so much to offer. Um, and, you know, I remember the time when we first, we, 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 we took out the gamelan instruments and we put them sort of in a central place in the university and, and we had like a little performance, just maybe 20 minutes or half an hour in between classes. Uh, and people just kept walking by, you know, and they, they were just amazed because first of all, they'd never seen, you know, a gamelan before, but also they, they were listening to the music and they were like, wow, this is, you know, it's so different. It's so beautiful. You know, some people, of course, not everyone likes gamelan music, but I mean, in general, like this, ju just, just this opening up, you know, of this thing even exists. And, and some people thought, wow, this is beautiful. It's mesmerizing. Other people just wanted to know where is this from? What is, you know, so, I mean, I think uh, there, and this is just one example. I think yeah. there's so many ways in which, um, you know, uh, so many things that uh, we have to learn from Indonesia. And I, I guess, you know, as a final, final word, first of all, I want to thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you. Um, and, and I want to, yeah, I, I just, you know, if, if people are watching this and, and, and they're interested, you know, in knowing more about our program or they have ideas for collaboration um, uh, and building bridges, then um, I, I would be very, uh, very happy to hear about those. Okay. We'll do that. Thank you so much, Ronit. Thank you. Bye. Teman-teman, itulah Profesor Ronit Ricci dari Hebrew University. Terima kasih. Inilah Endgame.